All right. Did that recording start? Okay, cool. All right. Um, so, all right. So cool. So this is, I guess, this is sort of like part two, um, because we talked about last week about the Brower group of a local field, but today we're going to talk about the Brower group of a number field. Um, and my plan, um, because of just like the nature of this material is I, I want to, the goal for today is that like, if you see the Brower group of Q or the Brower group of another number field, that you sort of have a sense of what it is. <laughs> um, this is more like, I guess, like, you know, understanding the structure, if you wanted to work with it, if you wanted to, uh, you know, have some applications of what does it mean, let's say to have a central simple algebra over Q, what does that look like? Um, and it's not gonna be a lot of proofs because, I mean, I've never seen any sort of streamlined treatment that goes through um, and builds up to the Brouwer group of Q or to the Brouwer group of a number field in a way that's like complete and not extremely long. And I guess like, Okay, because like Yale and I learned this in 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 Pierce. This is credit. This is all stuff that I learned with Yale. Um, and like Pierce really establishes a lot of things in a general way that you might not need for this thing. So it's like very um a lot of this is like leaning on general theorems, and so it might be possible to streamline this in a really like in, in a way that gets more of the proofs. But I, I don't think it's so simple. I think a lot of this is really general theory of division algebras, general number theory stuff, um, and uh, some Galois theory, like there's a lot of stuff that, that's going in here. Um, so I'm mostly going to talk about the what rather than the why, but I'm also happy to talk out any questions that anyone has. Um, and as usual, feel free to interrupt me um, as we go. Okay, cool. Okay, so the first thing, this is the motivation. I mentioned this last time as well, but I just wanted to mention it because this is what we're actually going to have the analogy to today, um, which is this idea of, of local global principles. Um, so the idea is like the thing that we're sort of going to try and hit today is the Brouwer group of I, I keep saying the Brouwer group of Q because the everything is so similar for Q or another number field, but you can think number field, you can think Q. Um, and one of the tools that we have to try and understand structures, algebraic structures over Q is to look at um, uh, evaluations in some way. So I wanted to give this this analogy again. So just to, to remind everybody. So this is the idea of, of um, uh, so this is the local global principle for quadratic forms. Uh, so this is the, this is called Hasse-Minkowski. Hasse-Minkowski principle theorem. So let's say, let's say like Q is a quadratic form over the rational numbers you can do this for a number field more generally uh, but let's just do let's just do q because we're just being motivational here um so then what you get is that the theorem says that q is q has a solution a rational solution so right so rational solutions to polynomials is like hard right this is like number theory um in in, in general like this is not something that we Know how to do if you have this multi-variable situation with that's degree two. Um, when does it have a solution? Well, it has a solution if and only if. Um, uh, so Q has a solution in R, and Q has a solution in the p-adics solution in the p-adics Q P. So for all primes P. Um, and what I mentioned briefly last time is that the so having a solution in R, when does a when does a quadratic form have a real, real solution? It's basically as long as you have a positive coefficient and a negative coefficient, you can you can make it work, um, more or less. And then with QP, it's it's a little bit more complicated, but it's still really um, uh, a lot more more tackleable. It's a lot more achievable um, if you have let's say a, a I forgot to check this. If it's five or six dimensional quadratic form, those always those always have a solution in QP. Um, so this is some sort of thing where where we've got a, a single hard problem, which is sort of considered like the global problem. It's they call Q a global field, um, and then we have some sort of like local problems that are easier to solve. And we can find out that if we have a solution in every local place, then we have a, a global, so to speak, solution. Um, so this is I I think this is like a super cool theorem. Um, <laughs> Okay, I'm still repeating myself, but this I think was my favorite thing that I learned for my oral calls. Um, just really very 
interesting, nice, surprising, um, and powerful. So I, I think so. So what we're going to do is we're not exactly going to get uh, a statement. Well, we are kind of going to get a statement of this form for central simple algebras, and we're going to talk about this to try and understand the Brouwer group of a number field as as a group, um, and see what we can get there. Okay, so this is this is all motivation. Now let's get back into the the practical stuff. Um, okay, so oh, did I did I one second? Ooh, you know what? This is the this is the handout version of the slides. Let me just change it so that it's the the you know the version with pauses. Give me one second. Yeah. Okay. So now. Um, Okay, so yeah, so I, I'm using the the notation. This is something that uh, I wanted to um, just write down so we all can see it, um, which is the the definition of evaluation, which is this is from Pierce, uh, Pierce's Associate Al Algebras. That's the name of the book from by Richard S. Pierce, uh, Algebras. Um, yeah, so okay, so Pierce defines evaluation the way that I think a lot of us would define the norm defined by evaluation um, or a norm defined by evaluation. Um, but I just want to put the, the axioms here so that we, we can be thinking about them. Um, so evaluation on a field, or he defines it for a division algebra, classic example of this book, having a lot more stuff than you need for just the Brouwer group of Q. Um, but he's, so, um, so if you care about evaluations on division algebras, you can think of that. Um, so it's a map from your field to the real numbers such that, um, is it not letting me do this? Okay. Okay, so this is uh, getting, the image is always uh, something non-negative and it's zero if and only if you start with zero. So this uh, jives with our experience of what is a norm, right? Um, it's also uh, multiplicative. And this is the sort of funny looking one. There's a positive real number um, such that the, so the valuation of x plus y is less than or equal to um, that real number times the maximum of the other two things, um, the, the other two value, the evaluation of x and, or the valuation of y. Um, okay, I think I'm gonna say a little bit, yeah, okay, maybe I wasn't not. Okay, then it, then it, depending on what this number is, you can, you can sort of classify the valuations in different ways, but um, I'm not gonna talk about that now, maybe I will later, Archimedean versus non-Archimedean. Um, but the point is this is something, basically it's some sort of norm, um, it may or may not satisfy the triangle inequality. Um, it's a different, it's a different, it's a slightly different, um, slightly more general definition. Um, okay, so this is valuations. Let's just keep this in mind because what we're going to have is we're going to have fields and then we're going to have fields with valuations on them and we're going to be thinking about uh, completions and things like that. Um, and the particular thing that we talked about um, last time was these local fields, um, which I said were these, this was the, um, there's really only like sort of three kinds of examples, um, or you could think of it as two kinds of examples. Um, there's the piatics or a finite algebraic extension of them. Um, and then there's also take a finite field and then take the Laurent series field um, over that finite field. And the idea of what these are, the like sort of description is that these are um, complete discretely valued fields. So we have a, um, in the kind of like in a, in a discrete valuation, which is, a case of the kinds of valuation that we were talking about on the previous slide. Um, so that's like a norm, it gives you a topology. Um, then if you're complete with respect to that topology, um, with the topology that is induced by a discrete valuation, then you are a complete discretely valued field. Um, so these are the examples. Um, and also they have to have this other condition, which is a finite residue field. Um, so I gave myself some space just to, to remind everyone what the residue field is. So what happens is you have this ring. I think last time I tried to do this in terms of the sort of like more standard um, like reversed definition of evaluation, but I'm just going to do it with Pierce's um, Pierce's notation, Pierce's stuff. So this is okay. So this is the stuff with um, oh, did I do this wrong? Okay, the valuation of x should be I wrote greater than or equal to, but it should be less than or equal to, right? Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah, less than or equal to, less than or equal to one. Um, this is a local ring with a maximal ideal, and the maximal ideal is supposed to be a curly M. The stuff with a valuation less than one. Um, and um, so what you get is, so this is a local ring. The residue field is the 
ring modulo the maximal ideal. This is a field because this is maximal ideal. Um, this is the residue field. And this is what we're saying has to be finite. So let's just think about this for a second. So uh, I didn't write down what the valuation is, but here on, on QP, it's the, the P attic valuation. Um, and on FQT, it's the T attic valuation, which is like the lowest power of T that's in there. Um, so basically what happens is here, the residue field is Z mod P or let's say, let's say FP. And here the residue field is FQ. Um, yeah. Okay. Th that's all I want to say about that right now. Okay. So this was local fields. Last time we talked about the Brouwer group of a local field. Um, I just wanted to review what that was also so we can remember because um, that's going to come into the picture when we try and relate the Brouwer group of a number of fields to the Brouwer group of local fields. <clears throat> Any questions on this before I go on? This is just what the fields are that we're talking about. Okay. Um, yeah, so, okay, so it turns out that the elements of the Brouwer group of a local field are mostly going to be these, are all going to be these cyclic algebras. Um, so I just wanted to remind everyone what is the cyclic algebra construction. So what happens is if you have a finite extension of fields, this does not need to be a local field for this construction. F does not need to be a local field, but you could imagine that it is because that's the case we're going to think about. Um, so take a, a, if you have a cyclic Galois extension, um, then what you can do, okay, so this is a, the Galois group is Z mod NZ, so you can choose a generator. Um, let's say it's tau, um, and also choose an element in the in the larger field. Um, then associated to these three things, the cyclic extension, the generator, and the element of the field, um, you get an algebra. Um, so as a vector space over, well, as a vector space over K, it looks like this. Um, it's some sum where U is some element, which has these properties. Um, so multiplication in K is, is normal, but then it doesn't, the elements of K sort of like, uh, twisted commute past u. So c times u is u times tau of c for any element of k uh, and any and for any element of k, right? This is a fixed element of the Galois group tau. Um, and you also have the property that u to the n is equal to b. Now, this is the definition of an algebra, um, of this algebra, and it turns out to be a central simple algebra over f. So, okay, this is some construction. I mean, it's not, it's not the most crazy way to define an algebra. It turns out to be a central simple algebra. This is something you can prove. Um, and okay, and then this is what, what's going to come into the picture when we do our Brouwer group of a local field. Um, so okay, so this is this is a, a theorem, um, which again I'm just reviewing because we talked about this last time. But this is the um, the Brouwer group of a local field is always isomorphic to Q mod Z, and the isomorphism looks like this. This is what we went into a lot of detail about last time. Um, so if you take um, the coset for a certain uh, fraction k over n, um, you map to um, the so this tuple is. I didn't I didn't emphasize this on the last slide, but this is the cyclic algebra, and this brackets just means the the class in the Brouwer group. Um, and okay, so but what are these things, right? This is supposed to be some sort of um. Uh, cyclic Galois extension, this is supposed to be some automorphism, and this is supposed to be um, some element of, of the big field. So yeah, okay, fine. So this is this is what we went into a lot of detail about last time. I don't want to repeat all of it. Um, this is the unique degree and unramified extension. It's a thing you have to prove that there is a unique degree and unramified extension. So there's just like a, you know, K and F is, is, F dimen is N dimensional over F, but also it's unramified, which means that the the image of the valuation is the same. There's some stuff going on there. Um, this is the lift. So if you have in, so in, uh, if you look at the residue fields, so this is supposed to be K and F. So, these, so F bar is finite because we have finite residue field. So this is like FQ. There's the Frobenius automorphism X maps to XQ, which fixes every element of, um, FQ, and so you can do some sort of stuff. This is some sort of automorphism on uh, K and F bar that ends up lifting. Um, the, that's the, that's what sigma is. It's some specific, also unique thing. Um, and a uniformizer is where you have. Um, so this is the, this is an element of the maximal ideal. Uh, you know, 
for k and f, like the, we were talking about before, this is supposed to be a generator of the whole maximal ideal. OK, so this is some stuff. Um, it's something that is like determined. Um, it's an algebra. What this is saying is not only is this map a group homomorphism, which is certainly something that you have to prove using facts about division algebras and, and central simple algebras, um, but actually it's injective and surjective. So um, in particular, every element of the Brouwer group of a local field is of this form. Uh, every Brouwer class is of this form. So this is really all just, I guess, like, we're not going to need the details of this to describe the Brouwer group of a number field in terms of the Brouwer groups of local fields, but I wanted to remind everyone of this picture so we know what kind of, what is this Q mod Z that we keep seeing? And that this is what it is. Yeah. And one more thing to note is that this, the the inverse of this map, it has a name, it's called in of F, um, at least in Pierce. Um, this I think is for invariant, it's not for inverse. Um, we're gonna get back to this map later. Okay, questions about this? This is just sort of like to have in the back of our minds, what is the structure that we're looking at? Okay. Okay, so now let's get to our, let's talk about our, our goal here. Um, so the idea is that if F is a number field, we want to describe the Brouwer group, right? So uh, I didn't, mention it this time, but right, we know certain things like the Brouwer group of, let's say, the complex numbers or any algebraically closed field is trivial. It's just one Brouwer class. It's a trivial group. Um, the Brouwer group of R has two elements. It's the you know identity element and also this element corresponding to Hamilton quaternions. Um, we know, okay, the Brouwer group of local fields are more complicated. They're Q mod Z, but that's still something we sort of have a handle on. and and Number fields are like, you know, they're some of the best fields. So we want to understand the, the Brouwer group of these fields. Um, and okay, so that's that's our goal here. Um, and I just wanted to mention that if you if you want, you can think about Q. I might even say Q by accident sometimes. It's it's a little different, you know, there's a little bit more to say sometimes with with number fields and with Q. Um, and I'm gonna be making some reductions where you can sort of think about things on, on number fields as if they were on Q. Um, but if you prefer and you just want to understand the Brouwer group of Q, you can sort of plug that in everywhere that you see F for a number field. OK. So this is sort of going to be our main tool, which is extending to the completion. Um, OK, so let's start with this. Um, so if you have your number field F um, and you want to think about a non-Archimedean, non-trivial evaluation. OK, I, yeah, I should say what non-Archimedean is. Okay, yeah, 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 I'll do that now. Mm, do I really want to do this? Okay, I'll, I'll say a, a mini version of what it means to be Archimedean. Um, so if you have a valuation V, the way that, that Pierce defined it, which is sort of like a norm, it turns out that this last condition, right, that uh, V of X plus Y um, is less than or equal to some A times max V of X, V of Y, it turns out that you get one of the following two conditions. Um, so it's either the case that it's the triangle inequality, V of X plus Y less than or equal to V of X plus V of Y, right? This is like, if you put if you put bars there, this would look like the, the triangle inequality um, or V of X plus Y less than or equal to Right. max v of x and v of y. OK, so on the triangle inequality side, we're going to call this Archimedean. Archimedean. And on the other side, we're going to call this non-Archimedean. So some examples. So an Archimedean valuation is, let's say, the absolute value on Q, right? That's the most familiar example, or on, on R or whatever, Archimedean. Um, non-Archimedean is the p-adic valuation is non-Archimedean. Um, so those are those are my examples. This is just to get an idea of what's going on here. There's there's some cases where we're going to have to classify by Archimedean or non-Archimedean, but um, if you want, you can think about absolute value versus p-adic valuations, and that's going to be the sort of the whole picture. Almost, almost the whole picture. Okay, so we have this we have a valuation. Um, then okay, so what you can do is you could take the 
completion. Okay, right, because this is some sort of, um, got some sort of norm and we can look at, you know, limits of Cauchy sequences, whatever, get a, get a completion, this is a, another field. Um, not gonna talk about the details of that. Uh, it turns out that the completion of a number field with respect to a uh, non-Archimedean valuation is a local field. Um, so you're gonna get like QP or an extension of QP. Um, and then what you get is that this, this it's Brouwer group, like we said, is Q mod Z. Um, and we know what this Q mod Z looks like. And then we're going to do the usual thing that you would do if you have a, a field extension and you want to map the, map the Brouwer groups, which was we take our central simple algebra A, which is an algebra over F, we tensor it up with the bigger field, which is like extending scalars. Um, and that gives us another central simple algebra. This gives us an element of the Brouwer group of the completed field. OK, so what this is going to do is now for every valuation, um, so this, this map, we also, so we have the same map. Um, um, for V Archimedean. And so this is something that we're going to be able to do regardless. Um, we have this extension of scalars map and we want to think about um, what can this tell us about? This is sort of our goal. This is something we understand. So what can this tell us? Right, so we would like kind of what I mentioned before, we want some sort of local global principle. Um, and so our question is, how, how good is this information? Uh, what can we learn about the Brouwer group of F by mapping into um, the Brouwer group of its completion with respect to different discrete valuations or with respect to different valuations? Um, and the answer, which is, this is the, the exciting thing is that this is everything, right? We can really, in some sense, capture everything about the Brouwer group of F by its maps into um, the Brouwer groups of local fields um, and, and, uh, and other, uh, other completions with Archimedean valuations, it's really just like R and C, as we'll see. So it's really local fields R and C. Um, and this is what we're going to talk about because it's not, uh, to be precise, there's a little bit of, of uh, tinkering we're going to have to do to get everything um, precise. If you get the statement precise, but this is the, the general principle that we're going to get. Um, cool. So, OK. So now I'm going to go into details, but do people have questions about like this strategy here? By the strategy, I mean trying to learn about the Brouwer group of a number field by mapping into the Brouwer group of uh, local fields, the Brouwer groups of local fields. Okay. If you have a question later, you can always interrupt me, even if I'm I'm talking. By the way, I'm always happy to take questions, and I really would would hope for everything to be completely. Uh, followable. So if you're even just lost, I'm happy to go back. All right. So here's what I'm going to talk about now. This is one of the, the technical tools that we need to get this precise, um, is this idea of a normalized valuation. Yeah. OK, so this is um, if you take a number field in any valuation, I'm not assuming Archimedean, non-Archimedean. Um, but what you get, so this is a number field. So uh, I guess I didn't technically say this, but this is, a, this is supposed to be a finite algebraic extension of Q. So. What happens is we can take our valuation on F, we can restrict it to Q, just look at its values on Q. Um, and then it's equivalent to VP for some unique prime P. Um, you know, I made a space, let me let me say the next one also, and then I'll, I'll, I'll say what it means for valuations to be equivalent. Yeah, okay, so if you have, um, it's Archimedean, then it's equivalent to absolute value. And equivalent means, so equivalent, So we say that V is equivalent to W um, if V is equal to W to the L, meaning I'll, I'll say it a little bit better, that for some L in R, which means that there's some rational, uh, some real number so that for every x that I plug in, w is just like an elf power of the value that I get on, on, on v. So they're sort of just like a scaled version of each other. Um, but if you're particular about what this, what this uh, number is, so we say that v is normalized if v restricted to q is the, uh, the p attic or uh, infinity attic, I don't know, the, the real valuation um, where the 
the uh, this number that's this coefficient that we're supposed to get is the degree of the extension. Um, truth be told, I don't exactly know why this is the right condition, but this is a way. This is basically we're going to go instead of have, looking at um, all evaluations, we're going to look at a subset of evaluations, um, and this is going to be this is going to help us get the precision that we need to really uh, nail down what exactly is the Brouwer group of a number field. Um, so this is if you if you want, you could think okay, special subset of evaluations that sort of hits them hits all of them in some way, but not. Not quite. Okay, so this is whatever. This is a special subset of evaluations that we're going to be working with. Um, these are the ones that are called normalized. Um, and what we're going to do is is look at the set of normalized valuations um, for our number field. And then we have this big theorem. Um, yes, okay. So we have our big theorem. Um, and this is what it says. So if, take a Brouwer class. So we're looking at our number field. Um, if you take a Brouwer class, uh, central simple algebra, look at its class in the Brouwer group, um, and suppose that every time I tensor up, so this is like, you know, completed. Every time I extend scalars by completing my field with respect to evaluation, a normalized valuation, um, then I get something trivial, right? This is the, this is the one element in the Brouwer group of F hat V. This is the trivial uh, Brouwer class. Um, then, my original thing was trivial, right? So the upshot here is that, so if I take central simple algebras over some, if I take a central simple algebra over a number field, um, so certainly if it is trivial over my number field, then it will be trivial over every completion because I'm just like, you could think of it as taking your uh, F, F tensor over F with FV is, is trivial, is, is FV. Um, but also the reverse, which is the non-obvious direction, um, that locally trivial implies globally trivial. So this is like, this is what I, I think of as like a local global principle in some way. Um, we've, we can learn about, um, we can learn about the Brouwer group of F, we can learn about elements of the Brouwer group of F at least from looking at their, their uh, completions or their, their, how they look with respect to completions, um, local fields. So, okay, so this is, a, this is um, so there's just a couple of things to note here. One is that, um, this is helpful to be precise that we have this valuation, um, this this normalized, the normalized valuations. This is like a a weaker, a weaker condition. But if if we were trivial with respect to every valuation, then we would also be trivial, like we we would also be trivial over f. So to to get this sort of local global thing, you don't have to do this SF thing. I mean, you can, and it will be useful to us later. Um, but I just wanted to point out that this is not like a restriction on the local global principle. This is a stronger version. Um, and okay, so now, so now we've got some sort of local global thing on, this, on, on the level of actual central simple algebras. And now what I want to do is move from here into uh, try and understand like this group as a group and what we can say about it based on this information. Okay, cool. Right, because we want the Brouwer group of F. And so we've got this following consequence of the of this theorem, um, the Albert Hasse Brouwer Noether theorem, um, which is the following. So let me let me break this down a little bit. Okay, so take your your uh, central simple algebra, take its Brouwer class, division algebra, however you think about it. Um, and remember this map inv f. So the inv inv f v hat is the map from the Brouwer group of. See, I wanted to write QP because I because I am thinking about a Q, but you don't need to. So the Brouwer group of f v hat to Q mod z, which sends the tuple of the three things uh, k and f sigma and uh, a to the k to k over n, maybe I'll write this, k and f sigma a to the k, which again, I wasn't going into detail about, but this is some algebra. This maps to k over n plus z. So what we're saying is that, okay, so for each a, I'll extend scalars to fv. Then I look at the corresponding element of q mod z. Um, and I'm just taking the, so since this is a product, I'm just taking that for every um, V in the normalized valuations. Um, 
I'm a little bit cheating, right? Because I didn't define what this, I only defined um, the inv for um, Archimedean valuations, basically. Um, so let me say something really quick, which is that let's say the inv r maps the Brouwer group of r, right? So this, remember, is just z mod 2. It only has two elements to 1 half z, where basically the Brouwer class of r is mapped to 0. And, and the Brouwer class of the quaternions is mapped to one half plus z. Um, and for the complex numbers, it's it's just a zero map. Okay, so but basically what I what I want to say is that this is something that's a a, a map that makes sense. Um, it's the im stuff looks like there's something going on, but really it's just the isomorphisms that we already had or the maps that we already had to Q mod z. And what we're saying is that this is injective. Um, and the reason it's injective is because if if something over here is zero, that means that it is trivial with respect to each um, trivial after completing after extending scalars to each valuation. Okay, so this is the first step, right? We want to understand this group, and now we have it injecting into another group, which I mean is is big and infinite and stuff, but like at least we know something about it. Okay, so to continue from here, here's the idea. OK, so we have this map, this injective map. And now I'm writing the injective map in a way that might be suggesting where I'm going with this. Um, right? So we want to understand this brown group of f. Um, so we want to continue this exact sequence. And if we can continue this exact sequence, right? if I have 0, a, b, c, z, 0, right? so this is an exact sequence of a short exact sequence of abelian groups, um, then I know that a is the quotient. right? This is. Uh, uh, a is the a is the kernel of this map, right? So b mod a is is c, and it's just like this. Guess it gives us some some structure. We can describe a in terms of b and c, right? If this is known, this if a b is known and c is known, and a is something we want to learn about, then this short sure, exact sequence is going to give us a lot of information. So that's that's what we're going to do. going to turn the page of my notes, but people can jump in with buttons if they want. OK, so there's just an, one more thing to do. So instead of this b being the product of q mod z, I want to change it a little bit. Um, so here's the idea. Um, you start with your normalized valuation. Um, you, okay, yeah. So now if V is non-Archimedean and like I was saying, I, I think of non-Archimedean as like everything besides R and Q. <laughs> and that's that's what we really are getting here. Um, this is like almost everything with, with let's say if you started with F, F being Q, then the non-Archimedean valuations are gonna be all the Piatic valuations and the Archimedean valuations is just like getting R, the absolute value. So. Basically, it's sort of in some way, uh, I'm, I'm arguing that almost everything is still Q mod Z. Um, but now we have these other other cases. Um, so for an Archimedean valuation on a number field, so this is another fact that I did not prove, but that that it turns out that F, that the completion is going to be R or C. So so V is Archimedean, and F is a number field. So, okay, so now what we're going to do is say, we'll replace some of our Q mod Zs with half Zs or zero. Um, and what it turns out is that you get, um, still this still is injective. So I'm arguing that that at least part of this injectivity is, is plausible, right? Because we know that um, our inv R map, right? This was the map that I was saying was going from the Brouwer group of R, which is like isomorphic to Z mod two, this maps to, um, it maps to Q mod Z, but really this map factors through a half Z because the only thing we get is a half and zero. Um, so that part, I mean, is maybe at least plausible that this sh this should still be injective. Um, the other thing, which I which is totally like sneaky, I think. Um, okay, maybe I'll ask. Actually, can anyone see what what might be like? 
what might you have to check still? Um, let's say that the, the R stuff checks out and the C stuff checks out. What else is an issue about this, this map being injected? I think I don't have the other part on the screen. So maybe I won't actually make, make everyone try and figure this out. Um, this was a product and now it is, is a direct sum. So what that means is that I'm not only claiming that on the individual level that I can map injectively, um, but also I need to check that this maps into the direct sum. So what I need to, need to check uh, to, to say that this is really a, a valid and injective map, so you need to check that inv of A is, I should say inv F V of A is zero for all but finitely many a, v. Right, because just of what, what it means to have a, a direct sum rather than a direct product. OK, so this is another thing that I don't have in the slides. Um, I will tell you that in Pierce, it is um, in 18 point, let me, let me say it correctly, 18.5, section 18.5 in Pierce's book, um, if you want. I think that's where he, he checks this, yeah. Um, so this is the fact that you need to check, then you know, once you've done that, you've basically done all the steps you need to show that this is an injective map. So rather than product of Q mod Zs, we have this sum of, of IVs, but they're sort of like, they look similar, and once you have this fact, then you get this still injective map. So this is changing the middle term of our exact sequence to be a little bit more precisely what we want. Um, and now we need the last thing, which is the third term in our exact sequence. Okay, so this is um, this is the theorem that I wanted to build up to tell you about because I, this is, I think, the way that you can get a handle on elements of the Brow group of a number field and just what this group looks like. So let's let's inspect it. So if you have a number field, we have this following exact sequence, and this is going to be our, our picture of the Brouwer group of F. Um, so the first thing is this invariant map. So this is, again, it's basically extending uh, extending scalars for each normalized valuation. Um, that's what this map is. Extending scalars for each normalized valuation, and then you know the image kind of depends on what the valuation looked like originally. Um, and then the second thing, so, okay, so we've got our sum of things. This is either Q mod Z or a half Z or zero. <clears throat> That's what IVF looks like. Um, so what we can do is say, okay, so for, so, so for some, you know, tuple elements TV, um, I'm going to map it. I'm going to basically just add them up in Q mod Z. And now this is okay only because this is a direct sum, right? You can't add infinitely many elements of Q mod Z and have it make sense in like a group theory way. But this is a finite sum because almost everything is zero. Um, all but finitely many terms are zero. And what this theorem is saying is that not only is this are, are these maps sort of like valid, um, but also that the the things that you get in here, um, the image of of the Brouwer group in this um, sum of IVs, is exactly the stuff that uh, goes to zero when you add up all of the right. It's, it's the kernel of this map, so it's stuff that adds up to like an integer, let's say. So okay, so this is this is um this is now a characterization of the Brouwer group of F that's a little bit more complete, right? Because the I'll I'll, I'll try and say it again, right? Okay. So what's an element of the Brouwer group of a number field? It's a central simple algebra over your number field. And what does that look like? Well, when you map it up to, extend, when you extend um, scalars to a normalized valuation, so you're either going to get, um, if it's an Archimedean, if it's a non-Archimedean valuation, you're going to get something that looks like um, a cyclic algebra that corresponds to something in Q mod Z. So that gives you an element of Q mod Z. Um, if when you extend to and if you if when you extend you get c is basically like zero. If when you extend you get r, then either you've got a trivial thing or you've got Hamilton's quaternions. In which case you consider that to be like a half. 
Um, so now you've got some list of numbers, uh, you know, elements of Q mod Z that all correspond to your um, to the different extensions of uh, different extensions of scalars to so different normalized valuations. Um, turns out that all but finally many of those numbers are zero. You can add them up. If you get an integer, <laughs> then that was something from from like you, that. It's exactly the things that will get you an integer. Okay, so it's complicated, right? It's it's not like this just is Q mod Z or this is Z mod two, right? This is a little bit more complicated, but this is what we would expect, right? This is like, this is exactly what, this is like what Q does, right? Q gives us complicated arithmetic information when something that's like a local field or an algebraic closed field will give us something simple. Uh, so I just wanted to give you guys this picture. This is basically um, the index that I'm happy to keep discussing. Um, but uh, yeah, this is this is this is the the theorem that I wanted to present. Um, nice. I was just thinking that would it be helpful to people to try to talk through like if I replace f with q and I assume that I have a quaternion algebra on q. What information does this give me? Is that something that? Yeah, I think this is a good idea. I don't know. Do you want to do that? <laughs> yeah, do I have a blank slide? Yes, I do. Or I have a blank page. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I would be interested in in talking that out. Let's 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 do that. Okay. Right. Okay. So let me rewrite the theorem. So we've got right. So this is the exact short exact sequence. So this is normalized valuations, but let me, okay, let me replace my Fs with, with Qs, right? That will be, we may as well, cause we're trying to get the concept here. So we've got Q. So we should, we should probably also talk about what is, what are the normalized valuations on Q? Um, but let's leave that alone for a second. So the IV Q, Now we've got our, so this is our inv map. This is our gamma map, which is sending everything to the sum. Um, let's do q mod z and zero. Okay, let's take an element in here, which is a, a quaternion algebra, right? So do you want to do a specific one, you think, or, or do you want to do a- Oh, I wasn't going to test my skills that much. I okay, was just fine. thinking so, yeah. like, uh, in terms of like knowing the, the, the fact that it uh, has period two restricts the denominators yeah. and things like that and right kind of right. gives like a helpful picture yeah okay so let me just say a couple <laughs> of things really quick so that people remember what quaternion algebras are um uh which i mean i know we discussed it but let me just like remind everybody so this is like this is like q um right q plus q you could say q plus qi plus qj plus qk where i squared is a, j squared is b, um, right? You still get i j is minus j i is k, right? I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, um, yeah, okay. So this is this is just like what this algebra looks like. Um, this is it's defined by this you know vector space structure and multiplication structure. Um, you have also the fact that it's it's period two in the Brown group. So if you um, if you add it to itself using the operation of the Brouwer group, which is tensor product, you get something that's um, that's wait, am I am I mixing things up right? So this is this is the. No, sorry. I mean, yeah, it's no, true right, at, right. at most yeah. too. Like it could be trivial. Yes. Okay. So this is either going to be isomorphic is. to a matrix algebra, which means it's trivial in the Brouwer group, or it's a division algebra where if you tensor with itself, then you get something that's trivial in the Brouwer group, which means that in the group it's like an order two element. So when you map to Q mod Z, because this is a group homomorphism, isomorphism, you have to map to something that's got denominator two, right? Either zero or a half. Okay, so so what are we able to learn from this? Let's see. Okay, so for the valuations, we know that. Okay, I, I want to avoid thinking too much about normalized valuations if we can avoid it, right? Isn't over so, Q just the normal? Is it just I think it's just going to be all of the just, P's and then yeah. R. Like, okay, cool. those are yeah. the only ones. 
because the there's no extension so you don't need to worry about like an n like the yeah. extension is trivial so your n is one so it's just the p-adic oh right 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 and yeah cool okay good good so what we should look at now is um we could think about this i didn't leave myself enough space i'll write it in a different color maybe that will be helpful okay whatever so we should i'll write this down here so this the sum of i v q for v and right okay yes i this makes sense this is really um, the direct sum for, let's say, P prime of, I guess I should just do Q mod Z, but this is supposed to be the Brouwer group of QP, the P attic valuation, um, plus one copy of a half Z. This is for cars Brouwer group of R. Okay, good. So what we want to do is now map looking at the different um, extensions, right? Because really what happens is we're mapping um, here to the tuple of A comma B over Q P, which now could be, you know, even if this wasn't, wasn't even if this was a division algebra, this could become a trivial Brouwer class or whatever. Um, so this is the, the tuple over P prime where people write infinity for the uh, absolute value. Okay, great, because this could be R. So now we can only get things that look like a half um, or zero. So what does that mean? Uh, let's see. Um, but I want to change the color of my lines, but I don't know how to do that on this app. Okay, whatever. Oh, I think you, is yeah. this notability? You, yeah, it is. I think you click on the head, like the blue pencil, it'll open up options. Or does it not do that for you? It's not doing that. Maybe it's mad oh, that I'm okay. also sharing the screen. I don't know. It's fine. Um, <laughs> okay. So, but okay. So let's, let's think about this a little bit more, right? So we've got, uh, I don't want to lose anything that's on the screen. Uh, okay, just gonna be messy. Okay, so so for the R thing, A B R is so it's either zero or one half, and that's gonna depend on um, basically whether A and B are both negative, right? Yeah, yeah. If they're both negative, you get something non. You get a half, right? Yeah, and if not, then. Yeah, and otherwise you get zero. Um, and then we would know it's so a b over q p um, for a p of prime. So I'm this I'm not gonna try to go down that rabbit. Yeah, um, <laughs> but, I feel yeah. like this is in Lamb's book also. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I, I mean, something I'm about this... if negative one is a square in the I don't yeah. know what and <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you have to do a little bit of like looking at. Oh yeah, right. This is like you can look at the residue field and do Hensel's lemma, maybe something like this. This flavor of stuff. Okay, so this is more, um, more. Uh, I don't know. You could call it like Galois theory, ring theory, valuation theory stuff that you could do here. Um, but this is definitely something that one would have the tools for. And then one of the th I guess what the theorem would be telling you in this case, right? This would be that if, um, if a and B are not both negative, right? And when you do the QP calculations, whatever exactly they are, you get zero um, for anything that could have been a half. Then, wait. Okay, think, so certainly, yeah. Yeah, I, I was going for like a much less rigorous uh, mm -hmm. description, yeah. which was just like essentially Right when I'm when I take a, a quaternion algebra and then I map it over using this short exact sequence, yeah, I get tuples that are like every element in the tuples either zero or half, and yeah. most of them are going to be zero, right? Only finitely many can yeah. be a half, um. So you just get like finitely many halves in different places, right? And they need to add up to one, so you have right. to have sort of like an even, even number. number of places ah. that have halves. Yeah, but you there are infinitely many 
ways that that can happen. So you you have infinitely many quaternion, different sort of non isomorphic quaternion algebras right. that are like, and they each correspond to a list that looks like that. And right. even if you find it together, a list, halves, then you yes. can get yeah a quaternion ah, algebra and cool. vice versa. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Yeah. That's that's a great that's a great point. Um, okay, cool. Which ones they actually correspond to? Is a, yeah, okay, that's a different thing. I, I, think I, I can't agree. quite do yeah. all the time, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, that, that's really nice, though. Um, you could, you could you know, spin it that you're, like, parametrizing the quaternion algebras. Um, yeah, cool. Okay. I'm gonna, I think we're almost at 11, so let me stop the recording.